Welcome to Pop Culture Retro, which was recently voted the 15th best podcast by the residents of the Golden Years Retirement Community in Boca Raton, Florida. Each show, we'll revisit some of your favorite pop culture memories with insider and outsider perspectives. Now, please help me welcome your hosts, Ike Eisenman and Jonathan Rosen. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Retro. I'm one of your hosts, Jonathan Rosen, along with Mr. Disney, Ike Eisenman. <laughs> and uh, before we go, I want to say, I hope we've enjoyed, I've been getting a lot of comments. I don't know if you've been looking at YouTube. We've been getting oh, yeah. a lot of good comments. Uh, and I'm very thank each and every one of you for watching. And if you do like it, please remember to subscribe, hit that subscribe gut button and uh, also for notifications. Um, I got to say, I'm very excited about today. But before we go in, because today we're going to do a Star Trek episode, and you have... Which is my, my middle name. It's well, like, I no, might well, be Mr. Disney, have... but Star Trek, is, <laughs> Ratha Khan has kind of That's become my middle name, say. adoptive middle name. <laughs> you have the good fortune to be involved with two huge, you know, pop culture, you know, groups. I mean, Disney and Star Trek. So, I mean, do you, how, which one do you get more normally? Which, it's got to be Disney first, right? I got to tell you, well, usually it's Disney first, but, but I, no, it's almost 50 50 now because, um, I mean, obviously, you know, we're talking about something that's massively huge. Star Trek is, 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 is turned into this empire, of course. Um, but that, Wrath of Khan is so well beloved, and 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 yet, even though it was like the smallest part I ever did, uh, I got I was getting as much attention for that as I was for Escape Witch Mountain, even back in the you know back in the day. I say back in the day when the film came out, and it's just gone on and on and on and on and on. And whenever I meet people, it's like one or the other. It's almost like a 50-50 thing, and and sometimes it depends upon you know it's kind of breaks down by by age group as well, but. I get just as much um, recognition from Wrath of Khan as I as I do from um, Witch Mountain. I have to say, I'm shocked. I'm shocked by that. I really am shocked by that. I mean, because I mean, you're just so known with Witch Mountain, and yes, I mean, you know, Wrath of Khan was you know such a great movie. But it, again, like you said, you're you're not in it for a long period stretches of time, but you've been getting a lot of sci-fi interviews because of wrath of khan oh yeah ab absolutely i mean it's 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 been fun and yes and these are going to sort of wrap around our own show talking about star trek now right. but um we're i think this year is the 50th anniversary of or 55th something like the 55th. anniversary of star, star trek yeah so um yeah i participated in a um i think it's called center seat it's a history channel um uh, documentary series about the history of Star Trek and I believe the third episode is all going to be all about the Wrath of Khan so um so you'll I'll, I'll ask beg my audience our audience to forgive me because you're going to hear <laughs> the same stories again but you'll also hear other stories and other people I don't think you'll mind <laughs> contributing to the overall the yeah the overall well I you know I I I looking forward to talking about it because it's not something I get to talk about at length and it was a really incredible experience for me in in, in, in a lot of ways both good and I you know and I will say bad and strange bizarre and different and all all of that kind of wrapped up together um in such a small uh such a small production experience so it was kind of crazy but yeah there's been a lot of of a lot of revisiting all of these films and the franchise and and yeah just sci-fi in general so um i feel like you know it's just so much fun because yes i love disney and i'll get into it and in in, when we talk about it but i loved star trek and i love sci-fi and i got to be a part of all of that all of it uh and so it's just like it's just like being a big kid man it's like being able to you know look there's nothing like walking onto the set of the bridge of the of, of of the enterprise i mean because you walk inside of that and you just forget it's fake it's like i forgot it was fake just like that even though i <laughs> walked through all the wires and the plywood and all the stuff on the outside I was gonna I ask you this. Of, okay, yeah yes. I, I figured you were but i'm jumping in right now because it was just like you looked around and i thought 
just feels real. I mean, it was just, it was, it was, you know, it was just a fantasy come true. So now you, uh, I have my own Star Trek things, but I, I'm going to ask you, I mean, I'm assuming yes. Cause you like, you know, we've talked about it. You're like this also like, like me, like a huge sci-fi geek and everything. Were <laughs> yeah, you yeah. big into Star Trek before you got into the show, before you made an appearance in the movie? A absolutely. And I used to watch it when I was very young. I saw, I saw the show in its first run on television. Um, because, it, I mean, I, I'm thinking of how old I was, maybe four or five years old, but still um, watching this space show that was so interesting on TV really imprinted me in a, in a uh, again, like everything else I've kind of encountered at that age. And um, as soon as it, the show went into syndication, I started watching it. Every time it was in syndication, I would watch it. I would watch it all the time growing up and even through my, um, my young adult years. Um, and as a matter of fact, it's probably, I should probably go about, back about five or six years now, but I, I finally decided and there had been a long period of time where I, I hadn't watched the show and I sat down and watched the original series again from first episode all, all practically all the way through in a strange late night binge. It wasn't one night, of course, but, uh, but I, I, it was, it, it, you know, it's just one of those, it's just one of those special shows that is so much more than just science fiction and has such cultural impact and such rich storytelling and and just i'm so imaginative and it just it feeds me so what can i say so that's the long answer to your question yeah mm -hmm. i am i mean how about you well I, i'm gonna say something blasphemous. before you were a, before you were a fan of, of mine <laughs> no, I, I, wrath this of is, Khan. <laughs> this is I, i'll say something about wrath of Khan, but this is blast i did not i was younger so i did not ski, see it when it first came out so and I did not watch the shows at all. I did see the cartoons, which had a lot of, it was the same story, you know, the same writers and everything I read afterwards. So I did watch the cartoons, you know, during the seventies. And then, you know, like mentioned another episode, I moved away for a couple of years and I came back, I came back in 81. So I think the first movie had already come and gone. I went into the, my first real intro was Wrath of Khan into the Star Trek universe. Oh, interesting. So I went to see that movie and I loved it. I, but I, you know, I knew it from the cartoons, but I loved Wrath of Khan. I thought this movie is amazing. After that is when I went and revisited the show and the first movie to start catching up on things because I wanted to see, because I didn't know that it was based on a character from the show. So I wanted to see where Khan came from. Oh, I wanted sure. to see the story that led to it. So I thought Wrath of Khan was so good. And, you know, I'm going to, I don't, don't kill. I mean, it's always, I always get my toss up, toss up between that and number four, which is my favorite Star Trek movie. I can go back and forth on it. Oh yeah. No, I'm, I'm the same way too. Cause I love the fourth film as well. I thought it was, it was it was such a clever and interesting way to advance the characters forward and 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 yet still be the original cast and mm -hmm. and I, I just yeah it, it's had so much humor in it which was that's what not it, some yeah. I I mean uh, which was not very you know typical of the of of the other films and and stories there's there's humor is inserted and used but I just I just thought it's kind of nice to be able to chuckle uh you know along with their the antics of these, well, I, yeah, these characters. And time travel. let's just say time travel i mean well, yeah i know travel, that's I mean. that's your that's your <laughs> that's your weak spot i get i know that yeah <laughs> but but again start but wrath of khan i thought was just fantastic and that really was my intro to the star trek universe and I, I, like i did it in reverse almost not almost did it exactly in reverse i you know the movie first yeah it's interesting the, the series so now I want to ask, how did you get involved in Rathcon? Now, do you go did, with, you just called for auditions? How did that go? Yeah, I just got a phone call from my agent um, saying, you know, it, like the typical conversation with an agent, it's always the same. It's like, are you available? As if I wouldn't be available for an audition, <laughs> period. But are you available Thursday at 11.30 a.m.? And this was on a Monday or Tuesday. I mean, this is how well I remember it. I remember the details because, it, <laughs> because and, and I just, I was, I had the phone in my hand and I just said, I started screaming. I said, yes, I'm available. Are you 
kidding me? Of course I'll be there. Because I, I again, being a fan of the series, and then um, when the first film came out, I thought, oh my gosh, this is great. This is what we need. We definitely need Star Trek turned into a movie. And, um, and you know, there's a lot of opinions about, about that first film. Most people most of the fans didn't like it. It was too plotting. It was too slow and, you know, not enough story or action going on. And, um, and I, and I have to say, I, I was quite riveted by it. I really enjoyed it, but this also goes back to my constant repetition about what a fan of 2001 I am, which is a very slow plotting story mm -hmm. with a lot of visual material for you to, to consume along the way. And that's, how this you know how this film was and it, it it really didn't work obviously to um support the fan base or really quite it was almost like they were everything i know i think everybody was playing in a version of star trek as opposed to actually actual actually star trek but i enjoyed it and then it got you know the reviews were not very good i mean it's, it made money it did not mm -hmm. make money which is interesting but the fans just, with as how much they hated it, I thought this whole thing's <laughs> dead. We're never going to see another movie. So, I when I got the phone call, I was not aware that. Well, I probably saw in the trades. I probably read about it in the trades that they were making the film, another film, which excited me by itself because I thought, okay, good, it's going to be, right. a, yeah, it's going to be another Star Trek movie. I'm right. looking forward to it. So then when I got the phone call, I freaked out because it, you know, it's. It's so weird to have these, you know, lofty um, dreams about being a part of things in the entertainment industry because it just you can't plan these things and you can't always make them happen. Disney was a massive dream for me, and that came true in a huge way. And being a part of Star Trek, I thought, wouldn't that be just amazing if I could play in that world <clears throat> for a little while? And then I get the audition and i'm just thinking oh my gosh i've got I've, i i i'm gonna bust my rear end i'm gonna work harder than i've ever worked on an audition and um and i did i i went in and i just first met with the casting director um and and just delivered the same performance that i ended up delivering in the film right there on the floor i mean i just i hit it as hard as i could and then I got a call back and I thought, oh God, this is great. I got a call back. <laughs> and uh, it was probably about a week later, something like that, with a few more people. I can't remember if Nick Myers was actually there, the director, right, writer, director, but um, he probably was. But boy, I just, I just ramped it up again and then ended up getting the part. And I was absolutely over the moon. So then when I got the script messenger to me after everything was taken care of and then, you know, found out what the production schedule was and. I just want to cut in one thing. Was this the most excited yeah. you ever were for a part? Oh, just about. Yeah. Cause mm -hmm. I mean, no, I, you, you know, I, 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 I can never, um, I can't ever impress enough about what getting escaped to which mountain meant to me. Right. Even at 11 years old. Cause I, 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 I had worked as, I had worked really hard to get a job at Disney. I auditioned for them 11 times, literally. And I counted, this is very few things I kept track of um, in my early days, but I would tick off every single time I went into Disney to read for something. Cause I was just so, I just thought, I just want to do anything for them. Mm -hmm. And then I would go in and read and give that great, what I thought was my best performance. And then nothing would happen. And so by the time which mountain came along and then that turned that, that I went from that to a screen test of booking it, I was hyperventilating with excitement. Mm. Um, so I would have to say this runs a very close second because I was older, you know, I was in my right, early, sure, sure. Um, early twenties or so when, when I did, when I got wrath of Khan and, you know, you're a little bit more aware at a, at a more advanced stage about, pretty much the ramifications of everything and i thought i thought wow if i if i have no idea what the character was other than the little scene that i did um and i couldn't help but think gosh maybe i'm going to be part of the enterprise crew going forward wouldn't this just be amazing hmm. 
And then I read the script and I die <laughs> halfway through. And I thought, oh, well, my, my Star Trek career was given with one hand and taken with the other that fast. But I was still tremendously excited to, uh, to be a part of it and, you know, to, to just to get to meet everyone. I mean, you know, I, I, I am a fan. I was, I, I, I that's what's fascinating fan. to me right now. That I want to, and, that's and, what I want to hear about. <laughs> and that, and, that, and, and that's, that's, that's the funny thing for me is I've worked with so many incredible people that I've known, I've known their work, familiar with their work, fans of their work, but um, there just wasn't, it, it was just a completely different feeling about getting a chance to meet the original cast sure. from this show I, I grew up with. You know, it's one thing to see people in movies and, and you fall in love with a movie, but, but man, when something's really a part of your life for as long as Star Trek was a part of mine, um, you, you know, first of all, there's a, they, they can never live up to, to, um, to whatever I or anyone else wants to project onto them. But I, I thought this is just going to be a blast and I just can't wait to I can't wait to step in and go to work and be around them. And 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 so it was it, it, it was it was really, really interesting. I mean, I fell into my work mode very, very quickly, but uh, but, you know, having to get over that first sight of, you know, watching Bill Shatner strut through the stage in his uniform is, is you know, kind of awe-inspiring. <laughs> well, that's, that's what's amazing to me is because you're, you were, I mean, you're a professional. You're a professional. You've had, you had a nice list of credits by the time that you were in this movie already. Uh, if you, if everyone goes to your IMDb page, they'll see that. Yeah. So you had a nice list of credits, but then it's, it's something else coming in if you're a fan of a show and you get that. I mean, not just a fan of it's not just any show. This is something in the you know the cultural you know I guess zeitgeist you know that everyone oh, knows this show. Yeah, a hundred a hundred percent. Um, and uh, and so yeah, I I I I remember those first impressions just being you know oh my god I'm meeting Cap Captain Kirk or Admiral Kirk in in, in that film and. And I'm meeting Spock. I mean, that's the one I got to say. And I'm sure it's that way for everybody. A anyone who ever got to meet Leonard Nimoy, um, mm -hmm. especially the first time you meet him, he's in the ears and the makeup and the costume. And he is Spock. It's not just, it wasn't Leonard Nimoy. It was like, you, it was very hard to detach from him. And I didn't spend a lot of time. I mean, this was a busy set, busy show. Um, it was fraught with some difficulties that I'll, I'll share in a, in, a, in a little bit, but um, so we, th there really wasn't like, you know, there was no hanging around and chatting with people. I mean, we, we were, everyone was there to work and it was a lot of work to do. So everyone was in their mode, um, including Leonard. And I, I, I know I met him briefly. I didn't really get to spend time with him because he mm -hmm. kind of kept, kept to himself. Um, and everyone, of course, just like their characters, they all have different personalities. And, uh, and that was the thing that fascinated me kind of the most is just how, how they all handled themselves within the context of them being so deeply rooted in uh, the Star Trek legacy and pretty much their entire careers were wrapped up in it. Uh, you know, only really only Bill and only Leonard had much going on outside of the franchise. The universe, right? So now. yeah, so there were varying degrees of 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 I'm not even quite sure how to qualify it, but just how how engaged they were with with their own legacy. Uh, which was now resting on this film. I mean, it really, it really was because this was, it was a high risk film for Paramount, um, and and for a Star Trek, especially a science fiction film, it was a relatively low budget. I mean, they had a very a restricted budget. budget, and 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 um, Nick had to, you know, had to had to had to create this film in a with a, a lot of restrictions associated with it. And, um, and it, as with anything, so it, it, with any movie that gets made or any project, it could have gone either way. Um, and luckily 
it turned out to be a really good film. I mean, I, I look, I enjoy watching it myself. And sometimes it's so funny by the time my part comes up, I'm I almost I'm my suspension of disbelief is so <laughs> so intact or detached, if you however you want to put it, that all of a sudden I see my face and I go, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm in this movie because <laughs> I, I just enjoy it. I enjoy it as a film. Um, Could you get upset at seeing yourself die as, as just watching the movie? Could you just get upset for that or just like, you know? <laughs> Only, be, only because it meant the end of my Star Trek career. But no, I don't mind it because I, I have never done a death scene before. Um, I should say spoiler it, alert in case anyone hasn't seen it. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, anyone who's watching this who hasn't right, seen yes. it is like, are you are you kidding? Why are you watching right. this? But uh, but um, no, it was interesting to do a death scene because, I mean, you know, it's a it's a completely different kind of scene we can just jump to actually that actual moment in 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 shooting the film because um i think they trimmed the dialogue they might have trimmed the dialogue back but maybe not because post my character's death laying there on the table hmm. you know bones covers my body with that metallic reflective thermal blanket which actually moves if your hair grows let alone if if you take a breath or my chest would heave or anything like that and i i'm i expire on the table and then i've got to hold my breath for the wide for the uh the master shot oh, for the remainder of the shot oh, yeah. and and i was trying to figure out this this technique for taking like <laughs> kind of like that really short breath so maybe you didn't see anything or or whatever but there was no getting around it. I couldn't make it to the end of the scene without taking some kind of a breath. But um, but Nick had told me not to worry about it because they were going to, he said, we're going to cut away from you know this shot uh, before that happens. So just hold your breath as long as you can. And then, you know, just shallow breathing will be fine or take another breath, try and hold it some more. And, you know, you just, you just try to make it work. So it's an, it's an interesting little technical thing that, that uh, complicated it completely. <laughs> Yeah, and you, I mean, you cover, I, I read your memoir, you cover this, you cover Star Trek Wrath of Khan extensively in your memoir. And by the way, you know, people watching, Ike does have a, a memoir out there. So, you know, editors, you know, <laughs> start paying a visit, start paying attention. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, I mean, I don't who was who was friendly to you or you, you don't want to mention that i don't know if you want to mention that who no was no friendly, i don't who was not who was aloof i know it's also kirstie alley's it's like one of her first roles right yeah it, it was and i know i don't mind talking about this because i i actually um i've i've come to understand it all over time and it, um it was yes it was kirstie alley's first I think her it may have been her second professional role, but the first thing she did was like, I don't even know what it was. I don't even know what kind of a, a part she had in it. So she had very little experience in the business. And here, this brand new actor, essentially, she, uh, she lands this, you know, major part. And clearly her role definitely was going to become part of the franchise. She was a new character. Um, and I thought it was, you know, just a good idea to bring something new and fresh into the into the franchise that then would allow them some more storytelling opportunities and, and other places it, it could go in other films. But the thing that I found remarkable about the casting of Kirsty was that she was the funniest person I had ever practically ever met. I mean, she and I she and I were both kind of the outsiders. We were the new people um, in the cast. And so kind of new characters uh, in terms of the story. And, um, and so we weren't part of the club. We sort of formed our own little club and hung out together when we weren't shooting. And, and, um, and that was kind of almost forced upon us because they really didn't want us on set when we weren't working, they wanted to keep the set as clear as possible, and only the actors that needed to be uh, there uh, to shoot that they wanted mm -hmm. there, everyone else, because it was kind of large. I mean, there were a bunch of, you know, especially my scenes, there were these trainees and all these extras and smaller parts, so it was quite a large number of people, and, and the way the production was set up on the Paramount lot, one stage were the 
um, prominent sets for the film, meaning the bridge and the engine room and and a couple of, I think a couple others. It was a big stage because that engine room set is pretty substantial. If you really look at it in the I'm, film, it's, it's sure three, it yeah, it's yeah. three levels. And that elevator that goes up and down was a working elevator wow. there in inside the set. So it was really impressive. And so to house us all, to give us a place to hang out, the stage next door became our break room, if you will. But it also had all of our dressing rooms, all these little pods that were probably about, you know, nine by nine or something like mm. that. Just just rooms we could hang out in, we could change and, you know, have a, have a place to go get away from everything if we needed to. And then they had an area that was open with tables and uh, chairs that everyone could then... Uh, you know, hang out, mingle or whatever to spend your spend your downtime before you had to be back on the set. So Kirsten and I just ended up spending more time together and just having a blast. I mean, she was so freaking funny. And and I just kept looking at her thinking, man, she's she's been cast to play this unemotional, half serious. Romulan, <laughs> half Vulcan, serious character. And she's just not this at all. So I, 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 I was deeply curious about that and how it was going to come across. And I was watching her, some of her work uh, at the same time I was doing mine. And, 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 and so I, I, I was just, I was very much fascinated by that, but because, because of our sort of place in the hierarchy, no one really hung out with us. It was, it was really wow. kind of funny. And um, Shatner and Nimoy both had, big you know winnebago style dressing rooms outside the stage that they could go hang out in and then i think i mean even that was stratified um i think deforest kelly had his own dressing room outside uh and james Doohan, but then george takei had a dressing room in the stage with all the other pods along with us so um, he he you know so it, it was like you you could see you could see which characters uh, were getting the most attention and which weren't. And the thing that was the thing that was immediately apparent to me the first day I walked on the set was how nervous everyone was. I mean, it, to make it, it was see. Yeah, I mean, it right. the most nerve wracking set I've ever been on. And and um, you know, truth be told, it was just everyone was anxious everyone was nervous everyone was working too hard to make it work and i could see that immediately and i thought oh wow well this is this is interesting um right up to right up to bill shatner i mean i had i my assumption was that bill was going to be just like Admiral Kirk or Captain Kirk, he was going to have all that swagger and confidence and uh, the whole time. And he pulled that off, of course, and he tried to maintain that posture sort of in a method actor kind of way throughout throughout the shoot. But he was constantly he was constantly going over his lines and constantly going back to Nick and looking for his feedback and his input. And all the actors were doing the same thing. They kept pull, pull, pulling on him all the time, no matter how little it was. And, and I, I could see that they were insecure, they were nervous, they wanted to make this work, but what ends up happening, which is difficult some, you know, a lot of times is that doesn't calm things down in any way, you know, you, you have to do your, you have to do your part <clears throat> to breathe through what you're doing so that it doesn't end up on screen um, in, in, in a way that's negative to the, to, to the film or the show. And so I, I, not that I was worried about that, because I thought, well, I've been on all different kinds of sets, comfortable, easy sets, fun sets, some stressful sets. But but I, I just thought, OK, I got the lay of the land now. I'm just going to do my job. Um, you know, the, the the honeymoon period was over very quickly <laughs> in terms of meeting meeting my uh, <laughs> my my sci fi idols. Um, and. And you know it was it was just very interesting what everyone's personality was like because DeForest Kelly, funny man, bones to the T, hmm. um, the character bones. He he was just like that. He was just a he was just a sweet, 
um, he was a calming influence because he was sort of someone who went around and was joking with with everybody. Um, Leonard Nimoy was much more aloof. He wanted to remain in the background. He didn't really engage with any of us unless we were, we were working together. And then he didn't even really do that. So he was pretty much playing the Spock character all, all the time. All the time. And <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, James, James Doohan <clears throat> was, was a sweet, funny man. But also I could just feel the neuroses coming off of him and a lot of you know, in, in the scenes we were we were doing together and um and and so I, you know it just it 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 concerned me to a certain extent but there was nothing i could do about it i'm just there to do my job so that's you know that's of course what i had to do the one the 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 the, the, the one actor that i just thought was absolutely amazing and didn't take it seriously at all was george takei because he He's just got such a great sense of humor anyway, but he had he had a sense of humor about his character and his part in it. He 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 had no illusions that 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 this was more than it should be or less than it actually was. And hmm. one of the things he did every day, every time he walked off the set um, and came back to our to the stage next door to the break stage. He would walk in and he would he would say he would do something like, ha ha, Sulu got his close up today. <laughs> and he'd throw his little cape around that was part of his outfit. And it was just everybody busted up. So he was awesome because he wasn't taking it seriously and just, you know, moving through it. But I'll lighten the mood a little bit. Yeah. So. So the the tension actually and, and it's funny, the way I worked on the film I only wor I worked six days on it, but those six days were scattered out over six weeks. Wow. I worked like I would look one or two days in a row, then I'd be off for a week, week and a half, oh, wow. and come back for another couple of days. So there was a there was a break in between because um, they were shooting it in script order, which you know they can do because all the sets are there. It's everything's right. contained, so they can move along that way. And my my character pops back, you know, in and out and in and out, and then out forever but um by the time we it came to doing the main scene um in the engine room um which is the, the second scene my character introduction happens a little earlier and then we have the engine room scene um we were again i felt i felt this 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 real intensity and this was from the entire crew as well i was like everyone was just too neurotic and and just working too hard and we were working through that scene because it's actually an interesting scene because it's done practically in, in one shot which i thought was great it was an interesting choice on on nick's part to um to move through it that way so there were no cutaways the whole thing had to work you know camera had to work you know couldn't mess up we could mess up um sound couldn't mess up so everyone was being very conscientious about all that but we were rehearsing it um over and over and over again and then shatner would go off and talk to nick and they'd have a powwow and then they'd come back and we do it again and do it again and then just before we started to shoot the first take shatner comes over to me and leans in and says look, you need to be, you need to be angry with me. You need to be tougher. You need to be tougher because otherwise, why would I call you a tiger? I need, I need motivation for that. So you need to help me. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I, I was just like, okay, wow, this is weird. And it's weird because actors never do that to other actors on a set. I mean, it just doesn't happen. It was, it was, it was kind of like opening a bathroom door at an, you know, <laughs> inappropriate time. It's just, you just don't. And I thought, okay, well, you know, no, I mean, I heard him. He's dealing with his own stuff. I'm going to do my job because Nick never told me to change my right. performance at all. And I was delivering my performance consistently every single time. So we do the first take and, um, and Nick likes it, but we want to do another, we got to do at least three or four. So we did a couple takes <clears throat> and then Cam the camera had a problem. They missed a missed a mark or something like that. So the camera operator said, "No, we need another take." And while they were resetting for that for another take, 
the camera operator, literally the camera operator, the guy who runs the camera, walks up to me and whispers in my ear, okay, you're not being military enough. You need to be more military. You need to be more military. Wow. And I thought, okay, now we've just gone to a whole nother level of inappropriate. I mean, this guy's talking to me about my performance. I thought, this is so bizarre. So he goes back, we shoot another take, we shoot another couple takes, and then there's another little mini break while they reset because Nick still wants to do it again and Shatner wanted to do it again. And so the cinematographer then comes around, he's checking, doing light readings everywhere. And, um, and when he gets to me and he holds the meter up in front of me, he leans into me and says, you're not being military. No, you're being too military. The other guys aren't like that. You're being too military. So you need to tone it down because it doesn't fit. And I said, I went, okay, now I've had enough. And I have never done anything like this in my career because I've never really had to. But I shouted across the stage, Nick, and he st- everything stops. I mean, the whole set just went cold because I yelled. Wow. He says, yeah, Ike, what's, what's going on? I said, are you the director of this film? And he kind of laughed and said, yeah. And I said, so I'm only supposed to take direction from you, right? <laughs> and he said, yeah. And I said, and you're happy with my performance? Is there anything you want me to change? And he said, no, Ike keep doing exactly what you're doing. I love it. I said, great. Thank you very much. And then I just wow. crossed my arms and I stepped back and no one talked to me after that <laughs> at all, including Shatner. He never said another word. And I, I, it, it was, it was weird because I'm just, I'm not a confrontational person, but I thought, I don't know how to handle this. I mean, do you go up and whisper to the director and tattletale on everybody or do I do something dramatic just so I can stop this because it was starting to make me very uncomfortable. I, sure. I, I thought, I thought if he's not happy, then I need to do something about it. But if everyone else is not happy, that's you know, whatever's right. in their head. But again, you know, in the moment it was stressful and had to be handled and it was handled. And I was able to then do my job without having to worry about it anymore. But again, looking back on it, um, you know, with some time and distance and, and, and knowing how insecure everyone was i get it it's like i get what they were trying to do everyone was trying to help make this thing as as good as it could be but that's the area of interference where you just you can't do that i mean that you talk about you know too many cooks spoil the soup you have that one person your director's your point person that's that's who you go to for guidance and they've got the vision of the whole piece you have to trust them and I did. Nick was amazing. I loved working with him because he was about as calm as you could possibly be, even though he had the entire weight of this second film on his shoulders. He was completely calm. He took care of everybody. I mean, no matter, no matter what anybody needed, uh, he would pull them aside, talk to them, settle it down, and then we'd, we'd go back to work. So, but yeah, that was a, it was a very, very strange experience and um you know, tough to handle well i just think it's incredibly incredibly nervy for one actor to tell another how you're supposed to do a thing worry about yourself and this is you know to me in can any profession you know don't don't worry about what i'm doing worry about what you're doing yeah <laughs> it just we'll take i mean it. There is a time and a place if you're if you're trying to work on the scene with another actor and maybe the words aren't working quite right or you aren't getting to the proper emotional place you need to get to, you work that out with the director. You have a discussion about it because you 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 know it's it's not always so easy. And I'll jump, <laughs> I'll jump, I'll jump to the next time I worked with Bill Shatner, which was on T.J. Hooker. I was going to ask um, you that too. And I and, and and you know that 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 was. You know, it, 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 was a, it was a fun show in a lot of ways, and it was very popular because it was on for a while. But I found, I found the writing just to be, especially the episode I was in, and the part I had to play was so cheesy and over the top. And, <laughs> and, and boy, trying to figure out how to get from, from like point A to even just point B in a short scene was so incredibly awkward. And, and, and you, really have to, you really have to work hard on that sometimes when the words don't work. But you know, in, 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 in this film, I, I thought the words uh, worked well and, and our, our scene was fine, but yeah, it was, it was just, 
because he did it in secret. They all did it in secret. They were all whispering to me as if they had the answer. And I thought, okay, got to deal with it. Did Chadner remember you and TJ Hooker at all or no? Oh, no. No, 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 no. (laughs) No, even... Yeah, it, it, you know, and he's a great guy. Look, I really like him. Oh, I love Chad. No, I love Chad. Still totally. a fan. Yes. <laughs> but he's just he's one of those he is one of those bigger than life personalities right. that, you know, if you if you don't uh obviously if you don't really make an impression on him, he just doesn't carry you in his uh <laughs> his subconscious or his consciousness for for very long. So no. He did not remember working with me. And then even after that, um and nobody knows this uh because you know i I never ended up doing the part but in the um whichever star trek god the star trek film that that bill ended up directing um yes Uh, undiscovered country or something yeah (laughs) yeah i think the undiscovered country he he there was there were scenes written in the script that were they were very odd. They all got cut out. Nothing was ever shot and it didn't end up in the film, but there were some kind of flashback sequences to a young Kirk and a young Spock somehow in silhouette and you couldn't really see them, but they had some interchanges, uh, some exchanges, a, a scene or two that they wanted to hire just voice actors for someone to play Kirk and someone to play, uh, to play Spock. So I went in, I went back to Paramount and this is okay. I've already worked with Shatner twice. I'm back at Paramount again. I audition with him in his trailer oh my God. recording this stuff. And he still doesn't remember me. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there going, wow. Okay. Well, you know, it's, 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 uh, I'll just, I'm just here to do my job. So I auditioned for this part. I ended up getting it which I thought was awesome. And then they ended up cutting it out of the film. So I, I, I actually am in a sec, it was wow. I didn't know that. <laughs> a part of a second Star Trek film. I got paid for it, uh, but it was cut before it was ever shot. And yeah, so, <laughs> but yeah. That is awesome. That's yeah, amazing. not a not a long memory does, does the man have of people he's he's worked with. Before. But he, he does have a great social media presence right now, by the way. Yeah. I, I don't, you know, you're not on Twitter, yeah. but trust me, he, he's very oh oh yeah well, on Twitter, and... and he's very active at the conventions. You know, he meets a lot of fans, and 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 he's he's always willing to engage with people, which I think is is great because if anyone could just say, you know what, I've I'm 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 done with that. I don't want to deal with it anymore. He's you know he's one that could qualify for that. But so on on yeah. that kind, did you did you sense any of the which came out years later? Any of the animosity that people had toward him no i mean i you know the only the only other you know and and this is this is this is a tough story no animosity towards him i never had any and i i don't really know anything about that if there if there if there really if there really was because i didn't see any i didn't see any conflict between any of the original cast members and but i don't know if it existed um you know because it's it's you know the funny the hard part about it is when you when you when you look at that show obviously you remember everyone as if they were an ensemble group but you know spock and kirk are the two main characters of that show their relationship was the most important everyone else was ancillary to that Mm -hmm. and so were the size of their parts it that's just how it worked and i i thought wrath of khan did a good job of spending a little bit more time with other characters, including Chekhov in a different way. He was the only, I didn't, I did not meet him on that film. I met, I met him subsequent to doing that at, at, at events and, and things like that. But, but um, yeah, he was the only cast member I didn't work with on the film. And as a matter of fact, my first scene in the film is with every single original cast member, including Kirstie Alley, except for Chekhov um, in the beginning. So I have this lovely, lovely image from the film that is, you know the the wide image from the original negative that has everybody's face in it and i'm right there in the middle so oh, it's kind great. of a cool cool thing to have uh, so for you me. get contacted for conventions for just star trek yeah yeah my the wow. first convention i did was specifically because of wrath of khan it was in st louis way back in the day before these things were 
very formal. It was kind of a new thing. Um, and uh, it was essentially a Star Trek convention. That's how it was billed. It was how it was pushed. And I asked to come out if, you know, if I wanted to, you know, come be a guest at this thing. And I, and I, and I had no idea what to expect <laughs> other than what the head of the convention was telling me because he's a wonderful guy. His name's Dan McGinnis. I don't mind naming him because he was a really great guy. He put on a really great um, convention. Uh, and I, 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 I had a blast, but he even started warning me when I was telling friends in the business, well, yeah, I'm going to go do this, this convention. And I just, I had no idea what was going to be expected of me. And they said, oh, good God, Star Trek fans, you guys, you're just, you don't even know, you don't even know, you don't even know what you're in for. And so I was so nervous. And I thought, what on earth could this be? You know, I mean, what is it about them? I just, I, I, I had no idea. And I, you know, I kind of assumed, okay, well, they're Star Trek fans, they're going to a convention. I didn't know they dressed up. This was a new thing. Um, I didn't know how many of them dressed up and how extensive their costumes were. So what, what happened to me was when, when I was met at the, at the airport by, by the half a dozen people all in their uniforms. And there was a <laughs> cling, one guy was a Klingon and, you know, they, they were, they were not as well made as so many of them are now. Cause now it's a, you know, it's a complete, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a whole world, it's a whole world of the, the mm -hmm. cosplay world, which of course we know is extensive. Um, but it really started with these smaller conventions that were just organized by fans. You know, that's that's how it started. So I'm I end up meeting, like I walk off the plane and I just I wanted to drop to my knees and just laugh because I did not expect to see it. So I controlled myself as best I could because I, you know, I, 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 I don't, it, it, I didn't mean it out of disrespect. I was just blown away by their willingness to dress sure. up this way and go out in public. Well, it got even better because the first thing we were going to do, um, the, the net proceeds from the convention were intended to support a pediatric uh, AIDS wing oh, at nice. a local hospital. Mm -hmm which I thought was great. That was another reason why I wanted to do it. I thought, well, well they're, they're, they're not just pocketing this money. They're actually you know, making a, a, a healthy donation to, to this hospital. So Dan wanted to take me and show me the wing. And so all of us went, we went into the hospital. We were met by whatever administrator that was there to give us a tour. And they were absolutely lovely. I met you know, a, a bunch of kids who are, of course, just, you know, compromised with such a horrific um, illness. Right. And, um, and I see, I get emotional every time I tell the story, because I saw these people dressed like aliens and Star Trek people fan out on their own, visit room after room after room and engage with these kids. And it just hmm. lit them up sure. they didn't know who i was they didn't know who i was they you know, they barely knew what star trek was but these people had come in to spend time with them and entertain them and engage with them and that it, it just i was i just i was blown away i kept grabbing dan and saying dan this is amazing he says i knew you'd think so i couldn't even tell you how to prepare you for this mm -hmm. but he said it's overwhelming it was truly overwhelming and all of these people were as I mean, it was, it, they were so generous and giving. And later on, Dan told me that one of these guys, who's the biggest burliest guy I've ever seen dressed as a Klingon, his makeup was terrible. He, he, he didn't do a very good job, but he did the best that he could. And he was very quiet. And someone I, I, I met, because of course I met everyone, tried to talk to everyone as much as I could. He was very shy and didn't really want to talk that much. But Dan ended up telling me later that his story was incredible. Um, and I'll get back to that in a second, because when, when, when I, when what I experienced at this convention was all these people, and it was thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're all geeks. Yes, they're all nerds. Yes, they were all socially awkward. But they all came together and they were having a blast. 
you know, mm-hmm. they were at their favorite, they were, they, they, you know, they, they all communicated with each other via email. The internet was in its embryonic stages at the time. So you, you, there wasn't a whole lot of way you could interact with people other than I think it was just based, I think email was available by then, but I ended up learning that there were these the, the Star Trek clubs across the country and the members flew out to St. Louis mm-hmm. to come meet each other. And each, each, um, each club member in a different city created their own spaceship and one guy would design the spaceship and everything that it does and what it can do and who all the people are on it and what their ranks are and so if you wanted to be a part of that chapter you had to you know start at one level and work your way up to another <laughs> level and and they, they were like playing this real life game where they were using the star trek universe and just creating their own pl- it was just i, I was just like this is amazing and i remember standing there saying my gosh i don't think ever in my lifetime will i have such a huge shared interest with such a large group of people that are so intimate with each other instantly because they have this one thing in common they had other things in common but really this one major thing and they were having a blast. And I thought, where am I going to, there's no X child star uh, conventions where we all get around and chit chat and play, you know, play games. It was just, I, I was just blown away and I had the best time. Um, so I saw the connectedness that everyone had to, to Star Trek. And it went back to this one young man who um, Dan ended up telling me that st- the, the, that Star Trek literally saved his life. He was someone he knew about, he was aware of in his social, Dan's social circle. And, and um, he had become very despondent in life and became suicidal oh. and was having huge emotional problems and social problems and came very, very close to, to taking his own life. And his friends got to him and somehow shared Star Trek with him. I, I don't remember what all the details were, but it re-engaged him with the world. Wow. And he went, from, he went from being that close to being pulled back to life and then turned out to be one of their best volunteers. And I ended up That's seeing great. him again at, uh, at other conventions. And, and he just, he, he, he yeah. So, so that's how powerful this, this, this stuff, without being dramatic, can save lives. Oh, no, I agree. I you agree. know. I, I, and I just, I just think that's, that's absolutely, absolutely incredible. So yeah, that's. Well, you just said it before, you have these people like, you know, we're the, we're the geeks, we're the nerds, whatever, but we all have each other. We have, we have others like-minded, you know, like-minded people that we can, we're not the nerds there. We're the norm there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So that's, and it's, it's definitely there. Now I, I have to ask now with the, passing of you know so and you know the unfortunate passing of so many of the original you know cast now do you find that you're invited more because you're a link to that original cast from a movie you're invited more to these things as yeah, a representative of star trek yeah it's, it's essentially yeah that that's what's happening i mean you know t- time does march on and um and um they are yes they are so many of them are much older and of course it's 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 sad but the, yeah. the, this these things happen you know the, it 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 does happen so yes being sort of part of the surviving um membership of that club does have more people reaching out to me to to i don't just represent star trek too because that's that's uh, giving myself too much credit but but as as a part of that film who is around and and um and I do. I love to talk about it. I, I, I love sharing my stories and meeting people. And 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 they, they they just they just eat it up. It's it's a, it's a blast. Oh, it's, it's such a great movie. And you know, I really like. I said to me, the two and four were the ones that just really stuck out the most in, in that original series. Uh, did you now? Have you watched all the reboots? No, I, no, I, I, I'm even, I, I'm going to now upset um, the diehard Star Trek fans. I, 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 wa- I, I watched, um, oh, good gosh, this is terrible. Also, I'm blanking out, but what the, 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 the first, um, you know, Picard's series, Next Generation, Next Generation, right. 
I started watching that. I never really got into it. I, 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 I liked it. I didn't like it. I would watch it occasionally, but I never really got hooked into it. And um, I think you're talking, if you're talking about the feature reboot. Well, I was talking about the movies now, but we can talk about the series too. Because- yeah. I, I'm just, yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the subsequent series, I wasn't as diehard a fan to get actually um, completely engaged in those. Actually, I do like the reboots of the film. I, I, I think they were really well done. And I like J.J. Abrams anyway. I mean, he's just mm-hmm. incredible. Um, and I thought it was very interesting, the, the whole Wrath of Khan reboot. Well, that's what, was, exactly what I wanted to ask. What did you think of that, that, it, that reboot of that movie? I, I thought it was awesome. I really did. I mean, Benedict Cumberbatch, Botch or Botch? Yeah, Botch. I think, yeah. He's, yeah, he's, he, he was, again, I love him anyway. You know, I'm a Sherlock fan. Um, yes. same, <laughs> amongst same. many other things. But I thought they were, I thought they were great. I thought they were great. The first one was incredibly engaging. The cast is fantastic. Um, and, and yeah, the, 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 just, just the design of everything. And of course, being able to have special effects where they are these days <laughs> yes. um, makes makes a really, really big difference. Uh, I mean, for me, I like the whole package. It's hard for me to suspend my disbelief when the effects are not really, you know, very well done. And I sort of thought Next Generation was, some of it was wonky, some of it was awkward to watch. Um, the original series did a really good job with their limitations. Um, you hear the mower in the back, so they're mowing outside, so you hear the... It's oh yeah, on. sure. Well, why not? Life, uh, life happens all around us, whether sure. or not we're doing a podcast. There you go. Sure. <laughs> but no, I enjoyed them very much. Yeah, I, I'll say okay. I'll talk about the movies quickly before I go into the series there too. I, I did love. First of all, you know, you mentioned the the cast. I thought was great, and anything that Simon Pegg is in. I'm in. <laughs> I love him. Yeah. Uh, I bet you, you know, the other day I mentioned to you, Sean of the Dead. He was, you know, so I love Simon Pegg. So I did love, I did really enjoy the reboots of the movies and I did like the, the con one. And, you know, th- I think he went by another name originally. And, but I'm, I'm thinking when I'm watching, that's con, that's con. <laughs> and then they, yeah. they went and then they yeah. got there. But I, I will disagree because I loved Next Generation. And, because I came in, I like I said, I didn't sit through the Star Trek. I saw them afterwards, the original Star Trek series. So, and this is after me watching the movies and everything. And so I was all psyched when they were redoing <laughs> Star Trek, you know, to do it to like another series. And I got addicted to Next Generation. I loved it. And to me, and and I know this is blasphemous again. That's still my favorite series. Next generation. Well, no, it, it's it, I, and, it, it make it makes sense to me because I mean yes, age difference is a, is 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 a big deal when it comes to all, a lot of stuff that we talk about. We're just far enough apart that that you slide up into a you know a different um, consumption generation, if you will, and I can totally see that. Um, I I just I, and I can't even put my finger on why perhaps I wasn't as enamored with it. Maybe uh, again, you so know, like the, the original. Of, yeah, the right. I like the original in the world of television back then. There were, you know, I, I didn't spend as much time watching TV in those days as, as certainly I do now, or I did prior. Um, I was just doing other things, and and so I, I couldn't watch everything and didn't really have time. So I just didn't gravitate toward it necessarily. But I think that makes sense. I I, I liked all of them. I mean, up to a point. I think. We had Star Trek, you know, the next generation that we had. I see, I'm looking at the, the Deep Space Nine. I, I still like Deep Space Nine. Uh-huh. And then we had Voyager. And then we started getting, after Voyager, they started coming out with a, like a lot, it seemed. And to me, it started losing the lust a little bit. I, I never got into so much Enterprise or Discovery. Uh, and even Picard, I, I wanted to see Picard because it's the next generation cast. I still haven't watched it. <laughs> and I, I should watch it, I guess, but I still haven't. The, the, the one I do want to see, I don't know if you've seen this, is Lower Decks. I, you know, okay, where did I see? I know nothing about this. I saw, I knew nothing about this as an animated thing, right? An animated one, but it's a, a funny thing. It's like, you know, all the yeah. people that they don't show you on the, uh, on the show. Okay, well, that's, 
That's a great idea. I tell you, I was just in Los Angeles this weekend, and from the ho the hotel bar downstairs, I was staring out at this billboard on the side of a building because because you know it, it, those of you who live in LA or been to LA, you know this. But when but LA obviously is very TV movie music centric, <laughs> and every every large flat surface on the side of any building that someone can paint an advertisement for a TV show something's or something <laughs> is something's there. No space. It's like, New, it's like New York City with the with with the yeah with all the lights right. and banners and stuff. So I kept staring at this thing with these great drawings on it that said lower decks. It was obviously Star Trek and I've never heard anything about it. So yes, I'm glad you brought it up. It's it that sounds like it would be a fun thing. I to need see. to watch that. I, I I've seen I've seen little clips of it and I I love the little clips that I've seen, but I haven't watched full episodes. So I do need to make it a point that I should have watched it before this. This is this is bad hosting, but is, <laughs> but I, I do need to watch because it does look really amusing to me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, 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 no doubt. I would, uh, I would like to check it out myself. But yeah, it's, it's, it's. Hard. There are so many of these shows now. It's, it's, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to follow. It's hard to, it's hard to keep up with it. Keep up with yeah, it. Just curious, did you watch the the uh, kind of Seth MacFarlane's uh, homage, kind of the the Orville? Did you see that one? I have not seen that at all, and I. I haven't seen anything and I love him. I love him, but I, what, so do you have to tell me, I mean, it's not a comedy, right? Is it, it's, it's a, it's, it's an homage it's, and it's not it's a takeoff. Both. It's, you know what? It's funny. There are a lot of funny parts in there um, yeah. too, but it's no, not done straight as a comedy, but, um, but it is, I mean, it's, it's Star Trek. It is really Star Trek. You know, the yeah. whole, whole concept is Star Trek, um, but he does have some funny characters in there too. I really enjoyed it. It was and then it, they got it was only on a couple of seasons. And they took it off and I, I they were supposed to go on a streaming one, and I don't know if it ever did. I, I need to check that out as well. But yeah, we enjoyed it. I used to watch that with my son all the time. Well, speaking of homage or takeoffs, uh, Galaxy Quest is a huge, huge favorite film Great. of mine. I I just think that whole play on the whole thing was just fantastic, and. And 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 it covered everything. It covered it covered the awkwardness of of that you know that being the actor's legacy and how do you manage that and how do you continue to engage in in, in these characters that you know pretty much the character you've lived your entire life and everyone identifies you that way and they you know the fan stuff. I mean that's what was so funny about it. The way they represented the fans in that film was so accurate. Because <laughs> you know they're really smart. I mean, I'm I'm telling you, these are some of the smartest people I've ever met. I was quite in, quite intimidated. So so just the way they uh, just the way they handle the whole thing, I thought was fantastic. No, I agree with you. I think Galaxy Quest is fantastic. I think it's so well done. But you're talking about the fans. I always I always joke, not joke. I see the jokes about the fans with you know when they ask the actors on the show in episode you know four thirteen when you went in, they know more about it than the actors do because they they've watched it so many times. Oh yeah, and they will actually pose a question to you about why you did this when very clearly you know, whatever, whatever thing they're engaged with could, doesn't function that way. Why did you do that? Cause it should have been, it should have been this as if, as if they know, and it's so <laughs> funny, but I will say the one, one thing that fans do bring up and they're right. Um, in wrath of Khan is the question. First of all, we have to address two things, the original cut of the film, and then the director's cut of the film, because okay. the scene I talked ad nauseum about here, was the scene that was almost mostly cut out of the of the of the film originally and all of that scene explained my relationship to Scotty um, being his nephew uh, and also just established that that tension with uh, with Admiral Kirk which was which gave you a reason to care for why my character then dies and also to support the, the the most awkward moment in the film which is when scotty carries me up to the bridge you know when i'm when, when i'm wounded in the engine room explosion mm -hmm. and everything finally settles down 
And then all of a sudden, the, the you know everyone's wondering what's going on. And then the uh, the the uh, turbo lift doors open, and there's Scotty standing there holding my nearly dead body. And the the fans repeatedly ask, "Why would Scotty take you to the bridge and not take you directly to sick bay? We don't <laughs> understand that. It doesn't make sense." And I was I was constantly under pressure to come up with a reason. So I said, "Look, it's dramatic. Life. It's a dramatic moment, right? I mean, it it, it pulled your heartstrings, right? Was like, yeah, yeah, I guess so. But you know, what? it just doesn't make any sense. And they're very <laughs> logical and thorough about the storytelling in 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 those shows and and that still is i think an ongoing thing for them they're very critical <laughs> you know you just mentioned i didn't even remember the part <laughs> this is i didn't remember until like this week when we were talking when we said we we're going to do the star trek thing that you were supposed to be scotty's nephew i didn't yeah. even remember that part <laughs> well yeah that's it and and and, and um and the scene was put back intact in the director's cut of the film. And it's and and what's hilarious about it, and I read Nicholas Meyer's um memoir, A View from the Bridge, which for those of you out there, if you this the Rathacon fans, if you really want to know about how the film was made, the evolution of it, and all of that, it's a gr a, a really, really good read. And if you want to learn about how the motion picture industry works from the standpoint of becoming a writer and a director in Hollywood. It's a fantastic read. Very engaging. Um, Nick wrote a great book, but he called me out by name in terms of, in terms of the original, the, the, the original release of the film. Uh, I think there's like one or two sent one sentence in there that's that said some producer decided to cut Ike practically out of the film. I didn't understand why, because his whole relationship with Scotty made no sense anymore. <laughs> and and he said, I was I was too. I was dumbfounded. <laughs> and so he said, I insisted in the director's cut that it be put back in. And I think that's I mean, I'm sure there may be some other things that were trimmed or cut out that they added back to the director's cut, but that was the main the main reinstatement of, of something that had been cut out so all of a sudden that whole that whole dynamic made sense because everyone was baffled by it baffled hmm. yeah so how, how many times now just as acting process how many times did you have to how many takes did you have to do the death scene well let's see okay there's the, the takes i think i did four at least four of the master shot and I did two or three of my close up. Um, not a whole lot. I mean, you know, we, it, 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 it's funny. This was not a take heavy film. Uh, they really, you know, Nick wanted to keep things tight and move things along because again, they were on a tight uh, budget. And, and right. when you get into doing so many takes, man, that stuff mounts. It just exponentially builds towards creating a longer uh, production schedule. So, when you when you when you have when you have to really when you're really worried about money they're always worried about money but when you really have to worry about money you try to get things right and done as quickly as possible so probably a total of um because i can't remember exactly visually the scene because there was the master shot that held like our our four characters then there was my close-up and i don't think i was I, I was physically on the table for the other actors during their um they're close-ups but i don't i wasn't seen so i'd say maybe eight times let's say total you find it tough to do to bring the same emotion i know i know it's your job but do you find it tough to bring the like that emotion out time take after take after take like you know i know it's only um, eight but you know. yeah no i i i don't i don't it's 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 such an interesting question and and um when I think about it, if I was doing it today, it would exhaust me. It, it's a, it's an exhausting thing. I have to say, you put, we, we put, a, no matter what the scene we're doing, even if you're not talking very much, you put a tremendous amount of energy into that because you have sure. to be present. You've got to be on your toes. You've got to be engaged. And, and, um, and, and I, I've never, I've never found it difficult to keep consistency, uh, with, with, with energy like that. Um, and again, that's the director's job. If you're, if, if suddenly you're in subsequent takes, you're losing energy or you're not quite where you need to be, the director will you know, rein you back in because they're the first audience member. I always consider a director the first audience member of anything that, that you do. And so they're, they're always 
making sure that that you need to be uh, where you are. And it does happen. I mean, it does happen. But I don't find it. I don't find it difficult to do what I need to do. It just then becomes. It just becomes tiring. And mm-hmm. so when the scene's done, the break is always very welcome before you move on to the next thing. Because if you we rolled from one thing to another to another to another, the job would be a, a lot harder and a lot more exhausting um, than it can be. Did, did you have any interaction at all with uh, Ricardo Montalban? No, I didn't see him. And I had worked oh. with him on Fantasy Island. <laughs> um, so no, I have worked with him and I met him. One of the most lovely men I've ever met in my life. He was absolutely yeah. just fantastic. Just, just as suave and debonair and, <laughs> and, and kind um, as he was on that show uh, in anything else he's done other than Khan. Cause of course Khan was a crazy character, which I thought, yeah. I thought he did a fantastic job. Yeah, I thought I he played that so well. Some people thought he was a little over dramatic, but oh, I thought, no, no I man, yeah, no, you need, you, you need a, you need an overly dramatic villain like that. Yeah. You know, we, we, we relish that I think as, as audience members. So I thought he did a fantastic job, but no, he was always on another set. He was essentially on another space. Oh, that's craft. a shame. <laughs> and, and I don't even know, I got to be honest. I, I don't even know how they shot uh, the scenes where he's, because when you think about it, Kirk's on one ship, Khan is on another ship. These are two separate separate sets shot at two separate times. I don't even know if Shatner was there. I would think I would like to think he was to to feed, play, right. you know, to, so they can play off of each other. Because right. um, you know, a lot of times, a lot of times that happens with with boy actors in in general. Um, there there are some divas that when it comes around to your close up, uh, if you have a scene with them and it's your close up they um they take off they they don't you know usually a script supervisor stands next to camera and that's who you're you're playing against which so, so, there are divas in the acting field wow I don't uh, well yeah you know what i'm sorry i i, I hope i don't get into trouble for saying no, I, this, I, who knew? yeah not that many not that many many and i and and and, and I, I tell you one one of the most gracious moments i had as a very young uh guest star um was on a series called Doctor's Hospital. It starred, starred George Papard, okay. who by the time he was doing that series, and I don't remember how long it was on. I think it was, it must, I think it was on for a few years. It was very successful. He was a huge star. And, and he had a deal in his contract, uh, which a lot of uh, TV series regulars uh, did because because like I said, doing even doing a TV show, when you're when you're the main character in it, you are moving fairly quickly from one scene to the next, to the next, to the next. And the hours are very long. I mean, honestly, you know, 12 hour days are pretty typical for mm-hmm. for any for a film or TV show. But George had it in his contract that um, at five o'clock, uh, he walked off the no. set. He wow. walked out, even if he was his close-up was being shot. If he glanced at his watch, he'd just say, and I watched him do it. He said, that's it, folks. See you tomorrow. So then they'd have to try to reshoot the scene. And I and I had a, a, a small part in it, but I had a scene with him. And, uh, and it was getting close to the end of the day. And um, I didn't know what was going to happen because we were still shooting my scene. And they shot his close-up first. He was done. And they turned the camera around on me. And an assistant director came up to him and said, George, it's five o'clock. You're free to, you're free to go. And he said, Oh no, no, I'm staying here for him. Oh, that's nice. To that's... make sure that he was off camera for me. And it only took five minutes. So it wasn't a big deal, huh. but it was a big deal to me. I thought the man just broke his own contract and he was, everyone was wow. stunned. They were stunned. They said, Oh yeah, sure. Oh, absolutely. He wanted to make sure he provided the off, nice. off camera <laughs> lines for me. So it was really, really, amazing so you know it's it's an, it's an interesting business from so many different perspectives when it comes to this stuff well i think you're right with uh, going back to Montalban. i think you were right i mean I, I, he had to be that he had you know you're only as good as your villain and he was a great villain in that in that role and uh and like you said the, all the pressure on that movie that movie that movie saved the franchise i think 
Oh, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, there's there's no doubt about it. We wouldn't have any of of any of the ancillary shows, I don't think, without the success of that film. Because then, it, uh, of course, it rolled right over into, you know, three, four, and right went on, and then and then you know the renewed interest and made it that much easier for next generation to to get a green light and get on the air and another hugely successful. Um, you know, uh, Star Trek franchise. And yeah, I, I think, I think you're right. When they, when you go out to these uh, sci-fi conventions now, do you still see any of the, any of the surviving cast, any uh, people that come out? No, not, no, I, 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 I really, I really don't. Um, it's almost like they end up at some of the, um, like a different level of convention than I usually end up attending. Um, but I have, you know, I, I did one of the, one of the most, well, I say last ones I did, um, I was at the 50th anniversary convention, Star Trek mm -hmm. convention in Las Vegas and everyone who could be there was there, including Kirstie Alley, which is incredible because she's never done an appearance, uh, representing, uh, Wrath of Khan, I think ever until this convention, and it was great to be able to say hi to her and 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 you know reconnect after a really long time. Um, Gotta try but, to get her uh, on the show. I'm gonna try. But uh, yeah, it it it's uh, but but then even you know it's even then the stratification. You know, I'm I my room was with like the supporting cast, <laughs> you know, members from the original series and 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 um you know just people who maybe had you know one or two lines on an episode back in the 60s and so it was like that room and then there was the, the stars rooms and and all of that it was a huge huge event very spread out so that tends to happen there as well not just on the mm. set <laughs> <laughs> you have the guy who played the gorn in like one thing <laughs> oh yeah totally i mean totally it's 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 very true yeah well, this, this is awesome. I mean, I, you know, I, I was looking forward to this. I, I, you know, I thank you for sharing your experiences. First of all, I, I love, love Star Trek stuff. And I, I love <laughs> Wrath of Khan. So uh, I, I, you know, we, we're going to have to talk about your Fantasy Island one day. <laughs> so, oh, definitely. No, we'll have to cover the, yeah, yeah, episodic or, yeah, uh, 70 See? series, because I, I got a chance to be on an awful lot of them and, yes, and each each one was a uh, unique in its own way and yes I have my fantasy island story so I'll share it with you then <laughs> not now you'll have to you have to wait no, the no, next no, one we'll guys. <laughs> anyway, we so anyway we thank you all thank you all for watching thank you all for tuning in for our Star Trek a special Star Trek uh, episode we hope you enjoyed and in the comments let us know which one were your favorites which are your favorites of the original the next generation or any of the uh, any of the versions that came along subsequently. And uh, as always, this has been Pop Culture Retro. I'm Jonathan Rosen, along with Ike Eisenman. And thank you for watching. And remember, please, please subscribe. Thank you for listening to Pop Culture Retro, where no one was hurt during the making of this podcast.